Welcome, everybody. Uh, wow, big day. And I just want to say a few things to get us started. Uh, it is, of course, a tremendous honor, and I should say a thrill, to be able to introduce Professor Noam Chomsky to give the formal inaugural lecture here at Karate Hall. I had the opportunity to introduce uh, Professor Chomsky 13 and a half years ago when he gave the inaugural lecture at Gordon Hall. <laughs> Obviously, he's the only person that we deem worthy of giving these kinds of lectures. And I am getting my second shot at introducing maybe the one person in the world who truly needs no introduction. I will nevertheless take the opportunity to make a few observations, superfluous though they may be. Uh, the first is to point out the obvious connection between Professor Chomsky's life work as a public intellectual and the tradition of political economy here at UMass. That is, Professor Chomsky has been for over 50 years a firm, powerful, relentless, and incredibly effective voice for social, economic, ecological justice and sanity in the United States and in the world. This is, of course, in addition to his real job, his fundamental scientific research in linguistics, psychology, cognitive science, and philosophy. Our economics program and Perry have also been committed to social, economic, and ecolog ecological justice for almost as long as Professor Chomsky. And the connection is not just that we share these fundamental commitments to human well-being, but that at our best, we are at UMass try to uphold the Chomsky standard of being as honest, relentless, and rigorous in our work as possible. Doing anything less means that we are not really doing all we can to advance social and economic justice, whatever our sentiments might be. How Professor Chomsky has made his contributions to human well-being is an incredible story of one person putting his very big brain and equally big heart to good use. How UMass Economics and Perry came to be what we are is a more convoluted story involving a whole lot of committed, talented, and visionary people. This includes many members of the UMass administration, some of whom are here right now. That is why Gordon Hall was named in part for our former Dean Glenn Gordon, along with the late great political economist David Gordon. We might have even named Karate Hall in part for our Dean Bob Feldman, who was so instrumental in creating Karate Hall. The only problem was that his last name didn't happen to be Karate. <laughs> the founders of the UMass economics program as we know it today includes, of course, Sam Bowles, Herb Gintis, Steve Resnick, Rick Wolf, Rick Edwards, and Leonard Rappi. It also includes Don Katzner, who is still going full speed in our program and who has written a great history of our department. Don was not part of the radical faction that came in with Sam Bowles and the rest of the initial group, but he was open to this group and he embraced diversity. Without Don and a few others like him, the program would never have flourished. And of course, the story also involves Jim Crotty. Now, Jim Crotty has received a healthy share of well-deserved praise over the past few months with the creation and opening of Crotty Hall, and we have seen his head get a little bit bigger each time. Um, <laughs> but what hasn't been said enough is that the contributions of Jim Crotty and the other founders of the program have created a daunting challenge for those of us that have come after them and are forced to try to live up to what they have created. It's very hard indeed, but nevertheless, something that needs to be done. All we have to do is look around at what is going on in virtually every other economics program in the US to realize that we truly need to carry on this tradition as effectively as we can. Hopefully, that job has gotten a bit less difficult with the opening of Crotty Hall. This is a beautiful new building designed by Professor Sigrid Miller-Poland that should give people in it the opportunity to work hard and flourish. But Karate Hall also creates a great fallback position, even for people who choose not to work hard and flourish. 
That is, all they have to do is not show up at the office, and they will be contributing to reducing energy consumption <laughs> in the building, and therefore maintaining it as the first net zero emissions building at UMass. And according to our energy engineer, only the 20th such building in the whole United States. Before actually letting Professor Chomsky uh, talk, I would like to just mention one other thing about him that maybe people don't know as well as his scientific and intellectual contributions, and that is his generosity as a person. Some of us have heard stories about all the people that he writes letters to in response and that he's so open to anyone, and I can tell you that uh, it's all true because I experienced it. And I experienced it first, I was 22, and I had just read his book with Edward Herman called The Political Economy of Human Rights, and I just wrote him a letter. And this is before email, and it was a letter, and I just sent the letter to his publisher, and of course never expected to hear anything back. And two weeks later, I got like a letter back that was longer than the letter I had written. <laughs> And uh, Professor Chomsky uh, went into detail on all the questions I asked, and then some. And this, again, was to somebody he had no idea who I was. I was just somebody out there writing him a letter. And uh, this is the story that people have told over and over again. And the last time when he spoke at Gordon Hall and did also what he's going to do today, which is give a second lecture to thousands, um, the last time, after he finished, I walked him to his car. I said, well, you must be really exhausted, and uh, you'll be lucky to get home and get to sleep. He said, oh, no, when I get home, I'm going to answer probably 85 emails. Uh, <laughs> so that is Noam Chomsky, and we are so fortunate to have him and his wife, Valeria, here today. Thank you very much. Noam Chomsky. Is it, is this working? Yeah. Is it too early to file an application to dedicate the <laughs> building over there in 13 years? <laughs> <laughs> uh, partway through the current experiment with uh, neoliberalism, uh, Jim Crotty provided an accounting of the record over uh, at that time, two decades of global economic performance since the onset of the neoliberal revolution. And I'll just quote the accounting. I wish it had been an epitaph, but it was just an accounting. They said, uh, the evidence to date supports neoliberalism, neoliberalism's critics. This is instantly 2003. Uh, the promised benefits of neoliberalism have yet to materialize, at least for the majority of the world's people. Global income growth has slowed, as has the rate of growth of capital accumulation. Productivity growth has deteriorated. Real wage growth has declined. Inequality has risen in most countries. Real interest rates are higher. Financial crises erupt with increasing regularity. The less developed nations outside of East Asia have fallen even further behind the more advanced and average unemployment has risen. East Asia, of course, is uh, the region that didn't follow the rules. <clears throat> uh, other analysts since have drawn similar conclusions. Uh, the overall record was reviewed recently in a careful analysis by Mark Weisbrot, Dean Baker, David Rosnick of the Center for economic and policy research, uh, they compare the Washington consensus years, uh, 1980 to 2005 in their analysis, uh, to the prior two decades, 1960 to 1980. And they found, I'm quoting, that contrary to popular belief, the past 25 years, 1980 to 2005, have seen a sharply slower rate of economic growth and reduced progress on social indicators uh, for the vast majority of 
low and middle income countries. Uh, the latter, of course, is the anticipated consequence of the neoliberal programs of privatizing state functions. And it's not just true of the uh, uh, low and middle income countries. We see it very clearly in the United States. Uh, among the OECD countries, uh, the US ranks just about at the bottom of 30 or so in social justice measures, ranks alongside uh, Turkey, Greece, and Mexico. And there's no need to review the well-known scandal of US healthcare, which incidentally is in a violation of popular w will, which continues to the present remarkably to support universal health care, despite virtually no articulate advocacy of this same stand. So quite recent polls once again reveal. Uh, well, recall that these assessments are all, they're covering the period before the great crash. This is the period of the celebration of the great moderation, uh, the triumph of efficient market and rational expectations theory, uh, the virtual worship of St. Alan, perhaps the greatest economist since Adam Smith. And to his credit, Greenspan did keep a close eye on the economy. Uh, in 1997 testimony to the Senate Banking Committee, uh, Greenspan recognized, in his words, uh, a typical restraint on compensation increases has been evident for a few years now and appears to be mainly the consequence of greater worker insecurity. Uh, insecurity that, as he noted, was markedly increasing at that time, even as employment prospects improved so it was deeply rooted. Uh, Greenspan predicted that these benign conditions of uh, greater worker insecurity would be only temporary, and as he put it, suppressed wage cost growth as a consequence of job insecurity uh, could not last. Now, he was mistaken about that. Uh, 10 years later, in 2007, uh, real wages for non-supervisory American workers that were actually lower than they had been in 1979 when the neoliberal experiment, the current one, was just taking off. Uh, that's a pretty remarkable record over 30 years. I think it may be unprecedented. And recall that 2007 uh, was the peak of euphoria and self-congratulation uh, right before the entire intellectual evident edifice uh, crashed to the ground. Well, other consequences of greater worker insecurity have recently come to light. I'm sure you've read about them. Uh, one of them, an interesting one, uh, followed immediately after Greenspan's Senate testimony in 1997. That's the dramatic increase in mortality among middle-aged white Americans without college degrees, uh, beginning in 1999, uh, recently documented by Anne Case and Angus Deaton. It's a phenomenon unknown apart from war and pestilence. Uh, they have an updated current analysis where they attribute the increase in mortality to despair and loss of status of working people under the neoliberal miracle, which are concomitants of heightened worker insecurity. Uh, another such effect uh, reached international prominence in November uh, 2017, uh, when the same sec 16, when the same sectors of the population uh, that are suffering increased mortality uh, turned for rescue to their bitter class enemy, out of understandable but self-destructed, self-destructive desperation. And the consequences for working people are now being exhibited behind the facade of uh, Trump, uh, Bannon, Spicer, 
uh, luster before the cameras. Uh, this is the systematic enactment of the Ryan legislative programs, uh, which are unusually savage, even for the ultra-right. And there's probably worse to come, as uh, further blows to working people are authorized by the Trump Roberts Court, which is soon going to address the Friedrichs case, and now with Gorsuch on board, will probably destroy, decide to destroy public sector unions on fraudulent libertarian grounds. Well, just to show how far we've advanced in this respect during the neoliberal era, we might listen to the words of Dwight Eisenhower when he was running for president in 1952. Now, here's what he had to say. I have no use for those, regardless of their political party, who hold some foolish dream of spinning the clock back to days when unorganized labor, unorganized labor was a huddled, almost helpless mass. Today in America, unions have a secure place in our industrial life. Only a handful of unreconstructed reactionaries harbor the ugly thought of breaking unions. Only a fool would try to deprive working men and women of the right to join the union of their choice. Now that's conservatism, vintage 1952, the days of the golden age of regulated state capitalism. So we've come a long way since then. Well, Europe has not been spared the lash of neoliberalism, uh, particularly after the 2008 crash, uh, which unleashed the uh, austerity programs of the Troika, the IMF, the ECB, and the European Commission. The uh, severe and uh, harmful effects of these programs, uh, particularly on the more vulnerable European periphery, have been very amply documented and excellent work by Mark Blith, uh, Yanis Varoufakis, and Mark Weisbrot, among others. And the policies have been criticized as economically absurd, uh, even by IMF economists. That's IMF economists. The IMF bureaucrats in the Troika uh, listen to different voices, uh, mainly the northern banks. Uh, Mark Weisbrot's investigations are particularly interesting. He provided, in his recent book, Failed, he provided uh, clear evidence of a political agenda that's guiding the destructive economic policies. He did something quite interesting. He investigated the reports of the regular IMF consultations with member governments. This covers 27 countries for the years 2008 to 2011. Uh, he stopped in 2011 because right after that in 2012, uh, ECB President uh, Mario Draghi uttered the magic words that ended the recurrent crises of the Euro. He stated that the ECB would do whatever it takes to preserve the Euro, and believe me, it will be enough. In fact, the words alone were enough, no acts were necessary, as had been evident from the outset. Uh, in the years before the magic words, Weisbrot discovered uh, what he called a remarkably consistent and disturbing pattern uh, from these uh, IMF government uh, uh, discussions, regular discussions, consultations. Uh, he found and documents that the crisis was exploited as an opportunity to lock in the neoliberal reforms. Uh, spending cuts in the public sector rather than tax increases, reduced benefits in public services, uh, cuts in health care, undermining of collective bargaining, and in general moving to create a society, as he describes it, with less bargaining power for labor, lower wages, more inequality and poverty, a smaller government and social safety nets, and measures that reduce growth and employment. Uh, the IMF papers, uh, Weisbrot concludes, detail the agenda of Europe's decision makers, and they have accomplished quite a lot. 
in this respect over the past five years. Now, the agenda is quite familiar here, and in fact everywhere where the uh, neoliberal assault has proceeded. Of course, populations would not vote for these so-called reforms, as Weisbrot points out and is quite obvious, and uh, that requires uh, another uh, element of the neoliberal program to be instituted. Uh, democracy must be sacrificed on the altar of locking in the neoliberal reforms. And the device in Europe is quite straightforward, simply transfer decision-making to unelected bodies. Uh, all three members of the Troika, including the European Commission, are of course unelected. Uh, at the ideological level, uh, there's also an assault necessary. Uh, the idea that people should have a role in determining their social and economic fate is one of the victims of neoliberal doctrine, necessarily. That's been revealed with unusual clarity in Europe, uh, particularly when the Greek government dared to ask the opinion of the population about whether they agree that Greece should continue to be destroyed by so-called bailouts, which in fact pass through Greece uh, without impact to pay off uh, northern banks for their incompetence in providing careless and risky loans, uh, while Greece's debt burden actually increases relative to GDP and the country is ruined. Uh, not unfamiliar here either in a different form. Uh, the reaction among European elites when the Greek government called for a referendum was utter outrage and it uh, got even more intense when the population voted the wrong way. And the Greeks were sternly punished for their illusion that uh, democracy might have a place in neoliberal Europe, uh, even in the country of its birth. The Troika conditions were made even harsher in reaction to this deviation from good order. Uh, the, there is, of course, a public response to the neoliberal uh, assault in Europe has some resemblance to what's been happening here. Uh, centrist political institutions are discredited, uh, public disillusionment, uh, fear, anger are running high, uh, sometimes taking quite ominous forms, uh, much more ominous in Europe than here, in fact. Uh, those who are old enough to remember the 1930s, as I do, in fact, uh, cannot fail to be alarmed at the rise of neo-fascist parties, even in Austria and Germany, of all places, and not only there. And bitter memories are not easy to suppress when a majority of Europeans call for banning of all Muslims from Europe, and many want to reverse uh, the real achievements of the European Union, such as free movement of populations and erosion of national borders, which is incidentally quite consistent with strengthening of cultural diversity. Well, we can't attribute all of these developments across the West to the neoliberal assault, but it is a common and I think clearly significant factor in the US too. In the United States too, functioning democracy has declined under the neoliberal <coughs> assault. This is, uh, uh, these are developments that are revealed with uh, particularly in uh, detailed studies by uh, Martin Gillens, Ben Page, Larry P Bartlett, a couple of other political scientists. Uh, the results show that the majority of the population, about 70%, the lower 70% on the income scale, are literally disenfranchised. That is, their representatives pay no attention whatsoever to their attitudes and preferences. As you move up the scale, you get a little more influence, uh, and at the very top, uh, policies are set by a fraction of 1%. Uh, the significance of these results was has been further underscored by uh, recent work by Tom Ferguson and his colleagues. Now, this is extending Ferguson's investment theory of politics 
uh, to a new domain, congressional elections since 1980, neoliberal years. And the studies show something pretty astonishing. They show that this is House and Senate. They show that campaign spending is a near perfect predictor of electoral outcomes. If you take a look at the study, it's literally a straight line effect over all of these years. These are results you don't find in the social sciences, maybe in quantum physics. Uh, but then it appears to be enhanced by the neoliberal assault on democracy, uh, which is re reasonable because it's implicit in the general principles, as you see also in Europe. Well, of course, there has been resistance to the neoliberal assault, uh, particularly in Latin America. The center-left governments that took power uh, during this millennium uh, have gone a considerable way towards reversing the lost decades, as they're called, of the neoliberal years, the structural adjustment years, the Washington consensus years. Uh, one consequence, and I think an important and lasting one, is that the IMF, uh, which is basically an agency of the U.S. Treasury in Latin America, has been expelled. It's gone. Uh, it gives loans to Europe now. Uh, uh, and also all Europe, U.S. military bases have been expelled from South America, even Colombia, surprisingly. Uh, there has been some progress in reversing the harm caused by the Washington consensus programs of the lost decades. Uh, regrettably, there have also been severe failures resulting from Chaldeism, corruption, and reliance on a, an unsustainable extractivist model, which as a side effect undermines domestic development. So you import, uh, export soy and import Chinese manufacturers, which destroys your own manufacturing base, and uh, so on. Uh, one of the better records is in Ecuador, uh, where poverty has been reduced by almost 40%, and extreme poverty by almost 50%, along with notable reduction in inequality, growth of per capita income, a substantial increase in social spending, and access to health care and education. And elsewhere, too, there have been advances that may be sustainable despite the current regression. Well, not every Latin American country participated in the reversal of the neoliberal assault, or reforms, as they're to use the preferred term. Uh, one prime exception is Mexico, which was subjected to a policy decision called NAFTA. Uh, which had the express purpose, literal purpose, of locking Mexico in to the structural reforms of the 1980s. And the effects uh, happen to be reviewed in a recent uh, CEPR study. It finds that Mexico ranks 15th out of 20 Latin American countries in growth of real GDP per person, real wages, are the same in 2014 when the study ends as in 1994 when NAFTA was instituted. The poverty rate has barely budged, while in the rest of the region, poverty declined from 44% in 2002 to 28% in 2014. And there's a string of other results which confirm the general assessment of the neoliberal programs. The modern experiment with neoliberalism was initiated in Chile uh, after the Pinochet coup in 1973, uh, overthrew the Allende government, and installed a harsh dictatorship. Now that's uh, called in Chile the first 9-11, took place in 9-11-1973. And what happened is quite informative about what followed worldwide and about the essence of these programs. Uh, before going into that, we might pause for a moment to compare the two 9-11s, uh, the first one in 1973, the second in 2001. And the easiest way to compare them is with a 
simple thought experiment. So imagine that in 9-11-2001, uh, the plane that was downed in Pennsylvania had actually reached its target, presumably the White House, uh, killed the president, instituted a carefully planned military dictatorship, uh, which murdered some 50 to 100,000 people and tortured 700,000 and established a global terror center. Now, that would, of course, have been far worse than what happened in September 20, 2001. And it is indeed what did happen in September 1973. I've changed the figures only to per capita equivalents, which is the appropriate measure. Well, the second 9-11 was celebrated by Al-Qaeda. Uh, its far more horrendous precursor was also celebrated uh, by the United States government and the business world. Uh, these are facts worth uh, pondering, but let's put that topic aside. Uh, the uh, US uh, had, of course, strongly opposed the Allende government and it celebrated the new military dictatorship with enthusiasm. Uh, among uh, other punishments, uh, loans had been withheld during the period of Chilean democracy, but 9-11, 1973, pulled the cork out of the bottle, and there was a flood of loans from the World Bank and private investors. The new military rulers were praised by U.S. Secretary of Treasury William Simon for having brought economic freedom to Chile. The applause was reminiscent of Washington's reaction to the military coup in Brazil in 1964. That established the first of the neo-Nazi terror and torture states that spread like a hideous plague across the hemisphere of the curse reaching Central America in the 1980s. Uh, John F. Kennedy's ambassador, Lincoln Gordon, explained that Washington supported the military forces that overthrew parliamentary democracy in recognition, I'm quoting, in recognition of their basically democratic and pro-United States orientation. Now, those two terms are synonymous. Uh, while the torturers and the assassins were carrying out their necessary work of cleansing the society, uh, Gordon hailed their achievement as the most decisive victory for freedom in the mid 20th century. Now remember, this is the left of the political spectrum that we're talking about. Uh, the democratic rebellion, as Gordon called it, uh, he then cabled Washington, uh, would also help in restraining left-wing excesses of the former uh, moderate elected government, and the democratic forces now in charge should create a greatly improved climate for private investment, at the bottom line. Uh, the United States is a global power. We mislead ourselves when we tend to focus on a particular area. We should think globally. And uh, policies and attitudes tend to be consistent worldwide for that reason. So we shouldn't be at all surprised at the discovery that at the very same time, 1965, uh, US liberal opinion was welcoming with unrestrained joy uh, what it recognized to be, um, quoting the New York Times, the staggering mass slaughter in Indonesia that murdered uh, hundreds of thousands of, of people, um, destroyed the political system, uh, and uh, instituted a vicious dictatorship which opened the rich resources of the country to private investment. It was a gleam of light in Asia, as it was described by New York Times columnist James Reston, again at the left, articulating the common view. And it generalizes. You can find case after case, which is quite similar. Well, the Pinochet dictatorship, going back to that, uh, they brought in the famous Chicago boys, uh, economists who were trained in the doctrines of the leading proponents of neoliberalism. And they had perfect experimental conditions. Uh, there could have been no objections because of the brutality of the dictatorship. They had overwhelming support 
from the hemispheric superpower and the institutions it dominates, like the World Bank, and furthermore, and quite crucially, the so-called free market economy could rely on a highly efficient state-owned copper producer, Cadelco, which is a mainstay of the economy that the dictatorship didn't dare to touch. Uh, it's worth remembering in this connection that although neoliberalism proclaims its allegiance to free market and free trade, uh, practice is quite different as the Chilean example illustrates. Uh, Reagan was much the same, much lofty rhetoric about free markets, but quick resort to extreme protectionism to save American industries uh, from more advanced and successful Japanese competitors, uh, automobiles, and semiconductors, and others. Uh, sometimes these were called voluntary export restrictions where voluntary means uh, do what we say or else. Uh, as the uh, more recent, uh, as for the more recent free trade agreements, take a look at them. These are at root uh, highly protectionist investor rights agreements. Well, the Chicago boys who had free reign and perfect conditions uh, proceeded to <coughs> impose the theore theoretical model that they had been taught. And they were visited by uh, leading figures, uh, Milton Friedman, uh, Arnold Har Harberger, uh, both of whom made a series of uh, well-publicized appearances to promote what they called a shock treatment for the economy. Friedman's words, shock therapy, rapid imposition of market systems is the only medicine. Absolutely, there's no other. There is no other long-term solution. Well, the experiment uh, uh, went on for a few years. Uh, by 1982, the results of the experiment were in. The economy completely crashed. Uh, note, in 1982, uh, that happens the year of the collapse of the perfect experiment. It was also the year in which Friedman reissued his classic uh, manifesto, Capitalism and Freedom, uh, with a new preface on the triumph of the neoliberal model. Well, in Chile, in order to salvage something from the neoliberal wreckage, the state had to take over a large part of the economy. This is one prominent Chilean economist who studied this carefully, Gabriel Palma, points out that the Pinochet government ended up with a share of the economy far greater than the Allende's government ever dreamed of. Basically, the whole of the banking system ended up owned by the government and a large share of the real sector as well, including export activities, manufacturing services, and so on. Uh, this was, some of you may, may remember, that this was called at the time the Chicago Road to Socialism. Uh, Pinochet then recognized the disaster. He sacked the Chicago boys. He brought in entrepreneurs of the traditional old right to try to set the economy back to some kind of functioning, uh, as it does, still relying very heavily on copper and, uh, uh, in particular. Uh, there, the, there is a post-dictatorship. The post-dictatorship years have been mostly center-left governments, elite center-left governments, uh, which did introduce some improvements, particularly during Bachelet's year terms. Uh, but there's a recent scholarly review, just came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, which points out, goes through the details, and points out that none of the reforms dismantled the underlying structures put in place by the military dictatorship. And in fact, there have been constant, and in recent years, very vigorous protests, public protests, over the privatized pension, health, and educational systems, which are failing most of the population, most, not the very rich, and not the military and the police, because Pinochet was very careful to ensure that they would be protected by the former state pension system. Well, the Chilean experiment with uh, uh, neoliberalism and shock therapy was soon followed by others. Uh, the most significant one was 
after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, U.S. advisors moved in, administered shock therapy in according, accord with neoliberal principles, uh, imposition of privatization, uh, the control of prices, uh, general market doctrines. And the result was the familiar one, economic collapse, a uh, loss of about half of Russia's GDP in five years, uh, also a sharp increase in the death rate, uh, reaching millions of excess deaths in the 1980s, and robbery of state assets on a colossal scale, um, largely by the old apparatchiks, uh, leading to the corrupt oligarchy and the Putin reaction. So that's another grand success. And uh, as we've seen, uh, hardly untypical, uh, or for that matter, hardly surprising, I mean, I began by saying that the Chilean dictatorship uh, opened the first modern experiment with neoliberalism. And the reason for the qualification modern is that it's not really new. Uh, similar socioeconomic regimes have been imposed by imperial powers for centuries, uh, pretty much creating the third world. And in fact, neoliberalism is a strange term. In many respects, it's not new, and it's not particularly liberal, uh, even in the technical economic sense. Fidelco example is perfect and normal case. Well, there's no time to uh, review the historical record, which is indeed quite interesting and remarkably consistent. Uh, what it reveals is that quite generally, from England to the United States to Japan, Japan, incidentally, the one country, the global south, that was not colonized and not by accident, the one country that developed uh, and that rejected the neoliberal principles uh, from England all the way through to the East Asian tigers. Uh, the countries that have developed are those that uh, simply rejected the neoliberal principles. Uh, for the United States, as I'm sure you know, these were advised by no less an economist than Adam Smith, who advised the New Republic to follow the principles of sound economics, to uh, uh, concentrate on what they're good at, what was later called comparative advantage, to uh, import uh, superior manufactured goods from England, uh, uh, crucially not to try to monopolize uh, the products that uh, they had a, an advantage in. The crucial one, of course, was cotton, the, the fuel of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and if the policies had been followed, the United States would be part of the third world. Uh, but they were instantly rejected. Uh, the Hamiltonian model immediately uh, imposed the highest protectionist tariffs in the world and enabled the development of a textile industry of manufacturing uh, later in the century, a steel industry. And in fact, uh, the US also uh, sought and almost succeeded in monopolizing cotton. Uh, that was critical. And the reasoning was very explicit. You go to the Jacksonian presidents, uh, Polk and Tyler, uh, they were quite explicit at the fact that if we can monopolize cotton, we can bring England to our feet. Remember, England was the big enemy in those days. It had the great power. And if we could only get a monopoly of cotton, uh, we could ensure that England would not get in our way, would do what we want. Uh, they came pretty close, not quite, because uh, England, at the time of its own uh, uh, dallying with the uh, market principles, uh, decided that it would uh, conquer the rest of India uh, so that it could try to gain a substantial amount of cotton and, of course, also get control of the opium that it could use to batter its way into China, which didn't want British manufacturing goods. And that's all called free market principles <coughs> in economic history. Uh, but that's uh, essentially the typical record goes right on to the present uh, the United States uh, the in was independent. It followed England's model of state-led development, uh, protectionism, uh, 
uh, what we now call robbing superior technology from others, in England's case from India, from Ireland, and the Low Countries, the US case from India, from England. And uh, uh, there was, as I say, some dallying with free trade now and then uh, when it looked as if it would be advantageous. Uh, these are the countries that were free from imperial domination. The countries that were under imperial domination were compelled by force to pursue these doctrines, and they became the third world. Uh, individual cases are quite interesting to look at. There's no time, but just to take one. Uh, England, the United States, the new United States and Egypt uh, were pretty similar in the early 19th century. Uh, they both had ample resources of cotton, the basis for the Industrial Revolution. Uh, Egypt was a rich agricultural country. That's why Napoleon conquered it. Uh, Egypt had a developmental leader, Muhammad Ali, uh, was planning to pursue the course of development that the United States successfully did and that England had done before it. Uh, but there was one difference. The United States was independent. Uh, Egypt was under British rule. And Lord Palmerston and others made it very clear that they were not going to tolerate an independent economy in the Eastern Mediterranean. So they blocked it by force. Well, won't go on with the rest of the story, but it goes on up to even US intervention in the post-Second World Era. So Egypt is Egypt, and the United States is the United States. And there are many similar pairs, which are quite interesting to look at. So if just take one. Uh, African historians, including uh, British African historians, Battle Davidson, famous African historian, have uh, argued with some plausibility that the West African Ashanti kingdom in the mid-19th century was quite similar to Japan in the level of economic and social development and policy formation and so on, again with one critical difference, the usual one. Japan is Japan, Africa is Africa. Well, history is a complicated matter, and there are many obscure interactions, but these are among the clearest lessons that economic history provides, and they're known to mainstream economic historians. So among others, Paul Baroche amply documents his conclusion that it's difficult to find another case where the facts so contradict the dominant theory as the doctrine that free markets are the engine of growth. Uh, there have been some notable successes of the modern experiment with neoliberal reforms. Uh, recall that these were instituted back in the 70s in large part in order to arrest the declining rate of profit, which was due to more popular power, particularly labor power during the activist years of the 60s. And that's been achieved. Profitability has been restored, uh, particularly in the largely predatory financial institutions which have exploded during the neoliberal years and are now even bigger and richer than they were before the 2008 financial crisis for which they were largely responsible. And as in the normal neoliberal fashion, uh, they are happy to rely on extensive public subsidy. Uh, there was an IMF study a couple of years ago which investigated the profits of the six biggest American banks and concluded that they come almost entirely from the implicit uh, government insurance policy, uh, which is not just the bailouts, but access to cheap credit and easy funding and so on. Uh, incentives to take risky, hence profitable uh, transactions, because if you get in trouble, the taxpayer will bail you out and so on. Uh, the business press, Bloomberg, estimated, the, looking at the IMF study, estimated the annual subsidy at about over $80 billion a year, which sounds high, but isn't really. A, another IMF study found that the fossil fuel industries get about a $700 billion a year subsidy. That's free market in the really existing capitalist democracy. Well, but there have been notable successes. Uh, the financial institutions have exploded. They're very wealthy, bigger than before, 
inequalities increased, the uh, rate of profits increased, and uh, there are other successes uh, that are insufficiently appreciated and should be looked at much more carefully. In fact, some of them have been studied carefully by political economist Sean Stars in recent work of his, actually at MIT. Uh, he points out that the conventional estimates of national wealth in terms of GDP are quite misleading in the era of neoliberal globalization. Uh, this is an era with complex integrated supply chains, uh, subcontracting, all sorts of other devices. And in this system, he discovered, uh, corporate ownership of the world's wealth is becoming a much more realistic measure of global power than national wealth as the world departs even more than before from the model of nationally discrete political economies. So he did a detailed investigation of corporate ownership using Credit Suisse and other sources, and he found that in virtually every economic sector, manufacturing, finance, services, retail, and others, the U.S. corporations are well in the lead in ownership of the global economy, either first or occasionally second. Uh, nobody else is even close. Uh, over, overall, U.S. corporate ownership of the global economy is close to 50% of the total world economy. Uh, notice that that's roughly the maximum estimate of U.S. national wealth in 1945. That was the historical peak of U.S. power. Well, national U.S. wealth by conventional measures has declined from 1945 to the present, maybe 20% or so today. Uh, but U.S. corporate ownership of the world has exploded. And the, the multinationals, of course, are nationally based, uh, supported and subsidized by the national taxpayer. So in some respects, all is quite well. Uh, neoliberalism has been a grand success. And I can end by quoting the head of state of Brazil's military dictatorship, uh, General Emilio Medici, 1971. Uh, he said, the economy is doing fine, but the people aren't, which is perhaps the simplest one sentence accounting of <laughs> so, uh, as you all know, uh, Professor Chomsky is going to be giving another lecture at 7.30, so we will not keep him too long now, but uh, we don't want to use your generosity, <laughs> but uh, some questions for now. Do you want me to call on people or do you want? Sure. Okay, David. Uh, do you see any uh, potentially uh, serious challenges to the current order uh, on the horizon at this time? No. Yeah. In the United States? In the world. In the, in the world? In the world? Or the, world? Or the, <laughs> the challenges are very, uh, well, let me move over. Let's take the United States. Uh, the most, one of the most Remarkable developments in the last couple of months was the Bernie Sanders campaign, which is quite astonishing. I um, mean, I quoted Tom Ferguson's discussion of congressional elections, but it's much more general. Uh, for over a century, American elections have been bought. Uh, you can almost completely predict uh, electoral outcomes and policy uh, by simply looking at things like campaign funding and the coalitions of investors, as Ferguson puts it, who coalesce to invest to control the state. It's a remarkably close prediction. Uh, Tom's discussed it in his book, Golden Rule, many other studies, this recent one extends it. Uh, that's over a century, and it's been well known. So you go back to 1895, uh, the great campaign manager of the day, Mark Hanna, uh, was asked once uh, what it takes to run a successful campaign. He said it takes two things. Now, the first one is money, 
And I've forgotten what the second is. <laughs> that was 1895, long before Citizens United. All right, that, now let's come to last November. Uh, a guy came up from nowhere. No one ever heard of him. Uh, no corporate funding, no wealthy funding. The media hated him and disparaged him. Uh, he even used a scare word, socialist, which meant basically New Deal Democrat. Eisenhower wouldn't have been surprised by his programs, but uh, he, he probably would have won the Democratic nomination if it hadn't been for the Obama-Clinton shenanigans and managing the party, he might have won the election. It's a radical break from um, the American political tradition, and it goes beyond. Uh, thanks to Fox News, of all people, uh, we have uh, an account of the most of the relative popularity of uh, political figures in the United States. Uh, Sanders is way in the lead. Nobody else is even close. And among young people, uh, much higher than anyone else. Well, that's the basis for a kind of resistance. There are plenty of possibilities. And similar things are happening in Europe. So I mentioned the quite ominous right-wing developments, but there are others. Uh, Podemos, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, uh, uh, like Varoufakis's movement, TM25, uh, these are all live and well. They could respond. Latin America was the case that had the most successful resistance. There's regression, but that's not over. So I think there's plenty of possibilities. Um, so how would you place Trumpism into this story? Do you see it as a continuation? Trumpism, Trump and Trumpism. Do you Trump? See it as a continuation? of this uh, neoliberal story? Do you see it as something different, uh, a more right-wing, neo-fascist kind of uh, assault on this? Or how do, you, how do you place this into the story? Well, I think it does Trump too much credit to call him neo-fascist. To be a neo-fascist, you have to have an ideology. And as far as I can see, his ideology is simply me. You know? I mean, there are forces that he's awakened. I mean, they're not a really awakened. They're already there. but kind of opened the door for, which are pretty dangerous. But I don't think, I mean, in my feeling at least, the threat of neo-fascism is much greater in Europe, uh, where it has a, a history, a basis, an institutional basis, uh, could come back. I, I, I think what's happening here is somewhat different. Uh, I think it's, it is pretty much what Case and Deaton pointed out, desperation. Um, there, People. There's all kind of factors. One factor is evangelical Christianity, which is a huge phenomenon in the United States. And it, it hadn't been, uh, it's become essentially the base of the Republican Party. Uh, the Republican Party went so far to the right that they can't get votes on their actual policies. Nobody's going to vote for the Ryan legislative program. So they've had to mobilize people on other grounds, nationalist, uh, uh, ultra-religious, uh, so on, uh, and that's, that's there. But a large part of the slight swing, and it was pretty slight in the last election, was uh, uh, working class, lower middle class, uh, not the very poor, uh, but people who have lost their hope, their dignity, their sense of self-worth, who see the whole world as against them, their, being attacked from below by worthless people who, as they see it, are being helped by the federal government, uh, attacked from above by the rich people who are taking everything, uh, don't have jobs, uh, their uh, social status is gone, uh, mortality is increasing, uh, uh, desperation is increasing. So they turn to their class enemy. Where else are they going to go? The Democratic Party abandoned the working class uh, 40 years ago. Uh, in fact, a lot of these people voted for Obama, uh, believing the uh, rhetoric about hope and change. Okay, no hope, no change. Uh, by 2010, uh, right here in Massachusetts, there was already a reversal. Uh, a lot of union households voted for Brown in 2010, and the Kennedy, you know, and the, on the seat that Kennedy had, it was quite a change. And the studies of their voting showed that a lot of it was just anger at Obama. Uh, he was attacking their, uh, 
the rights that they had struggled for, like health rights, and he wasn't doing anything for them. So they turned to Brown. This time they turned to Trump. Uh, what's going to be interesting to see and could lead to something like neo-fascism, I think, is what will happen when uh, the con game collapses. Uh, sooner or later, working people are going to see that uh, the programs that are being instituted are directed against them, case by case. You know, it's, it's kind of hidden behind the bluster. But if you take a look at the programs, the Ryan-style programs, it's exactly what they are. So sooner or later, that game is going to collapse. And then what happens? Probably scapegoating, uh, maybe some wild action, maybe the kind of thing that could inspire some kind of ultra-right xenophobic movement. was Brazil. It was uh, Celso Amarim's uh, foreign policy when he was the foreign minister for the Lula government. Actually, he's touring around the United States now with uh, talking about a very interesting memoir of his that just came out, which you might want to look at. It's called, uh, what's it called? Uh, global. Acting globally. Hmm? Acting globally. Acting globally just appeared in English, it had appeared in, and uh, he discusses a, a lot of these developments. It was very substantially his initiative uh, that uh, began the, with South Africa at first, because Brazil's always had close you know, relations, uh, geographic, uh, ethnic, and others with South Africa. And uh, it expanded from Brazil and South Africa to uh, India, then Russia wanted in, and China wanted in, and they became a sort of an independent bloc. Uh, the United States, of course, never liked that very much. Uh, and uh, now with the f uh, takeover in Brazil of the far-right government, the Tamar government is unbelievable. It's uh, trying to dismantle every decent thing that was done in the last years, and imposing some legislation, which is almost unthinkable, like a constitutional amendment uh, which bars any increase in spending for 20 years, I mean, which is devastating. We know exactly what that means. Uh, so far, there isn't much resistance in Brazil, but I think it'll break out. I don't think they can tolerate that. And uh, what's happened is that the whole South-South effort, including BRICS, has significantly declined. Uh, largely because of the loss of Brazilian initiative. But uh, uh, and this is also true of the uh, institutions that, the independent institutions that developed in South America, like UNASUR. And uh, the most interesting one was CELAC, which includes every country of the Western Hemisphere except the United States and Canada, which is quite striking. Uh, but at the moment, it's on hold. Uh, it depends what happens in the rest of the hemisphere. Uh, Russia, of course, going its own way. China, meanwhile, just sails along on their own uh, slow, independent policy of trying to create, uh, you know, recreate the old Middle Kingdom, basically. <laughs> There were two recent challenges to neoliberalism and totalitarianism. Two. two recent challenges to neoliberal policies. 
one in Greece, the other one in Turkey. In my view, the both of one them, in one in Greece, uh, Syriza, Syriza yeah. movement, the other one in Turkey. In, uh, in Turkey, Turkey, Kurdish movement. Oh, the Kurdish movement. Yeah, and oh. both of them are in retreat. Well, and first of all, I don't well, think... Why is this and what kind of lessons we could draw from this? Well, the, the, uh, Turkey is a little bit different, I think. The, I, I don't think the Kurdish movement was a... In, within Turkey, there's Kurds all over the place, but the, uh, most of the Kurds are in southeast Turkey. And uh, I've been pretty much closely involved with them since the 90s. I've been there a number of times and so on. Uh, I think they're just uh, seeking uh, basically cultural autonomy and independence within Turkey. They were bitterly, brutally treated in the 1990s. This is one of the main atrocities of the 1990s, which is almost unknown here for a very simple reason. So the United States was providing almost the total support for it. Uh, Clinton was providing 80% of the arms for the uh, horrible atrocities that were going on. Uh, the New York Times, uh, of course, had a bureau in Ankara which wouldn't report it. Uh, Thousands of towns and villages were destroyed, uh, maybe 50,000 people killed, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions driven out. It was a real awful time. Uh, you couldn't, uh, the children couldn't wear Kurdish colors, couldn't talk Kurdish, nothing. And in the early part of this millennium, there was a reversal, uh, and uh, things did start getting better and started improving. And uh, uh, Ojalan, you know, the official leader, uh, actually changed poli official policy and said they, only, they don't want independence, they want some kind of autonomy or recognition. They weren't even recognized to be Kurds. You couldn't be recognized to be a Kurd. You were a mountain Turk, you know. And I think uh, this has now reversed. Uh, Erdogan is carrying out a brutal assault against Southeast uh, Turkey and the Kurds, with, again, going back almost to the 90s. But I don't think it had anything to do with neoliberalism. I think it has to do with Turkey's uh, special effort, especially under Erdogan, to uh, create a real kind of neo-fascist state, uh, xenophobic, uh, uh, is Islamist, uh, gathering power in his own hands. He's, he's expelled thousands, tens of thousands of people, of public servants, closed down universities, uh, and the Kurds are suffering most harshly. On the other hand, there is a Kurdish uh, reaction, not so much to neoliberalism as to uh, kind of general repression, and that's in Syria, the Rojava, and the Turks are very much opposed to that, of course. Uh, but that's a separate thing. In Greece, as I said, there were efforts by the Syriza government to try to uh, follow the, to, to try to extricate Greece from the uh, destructive effects of the programs instituted mainly by the German banks, uh, to try to get back the payment for the bad loans they made, which is what it amounted to, uh, Greece being the punching bag on the way. And when they tried, uh, they were beaten down. Syriza pretty much gave up and has lost uh, much, most of its credibility within Greece. Now, whether they could have done anything else, you could debate. I mean, one of the tragedies was that the Syriza government was not supported uh, by the other uh, kind of progressive movements in Europe, of course, the United States, so they were left alone, kind of dangling on the vine, and they couldn't do much. So, last question. Okay. Um, I had a question that's kind of more kind of dear to what we're doing here. How has the uh, privatization of public colleges and universities affected the development of a popular alternative to neoliberalism? In the United States. In the United States. Well, as you know, uh, uh, public funding for universities has sharply declined. Uh, state funding for the state universities has gone way down. Uh, tuitions have gone way up. Uh, 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 I don't think you can find any economic reason for this. If you take a look at uh, around the world, 
uh, the, uh, the most successful state capitalist economy in the world is Germany. Uh, education's free. Uh, the country that all, uh, ranks at the top or close to the top on all international uh, uh, studies is Finland. Uh, education's free. Uh, go right south of the border, Mexico, poor country. Uh, UNAM, National University, is quite high quality. I mean, salaries are horrendous, but you have to have a couple of jobs if you want to teach. But uh, the educational uh, research level is quite impressive. It's free. Uh, take the United States. I mean, in the 1950s, the United States is a much poorer country than it is today, far poorer. Education was basically free. Uh, the GI Bill uh, offered not only free education, but even subsidy to huge numbers of people. Of course, it was racially based. You had to be white uh, to uh, get a, an education which they never would have been able to get themselves. It was very good for them. It was very good for the country. It's part of the reason for the success of those years. In fact, even uh, private universities were very inexpensive. In 1945, when I went to college, uh, I went to the University of Pennsylvania, you know, Ivy League University. Uh, tuition was $100 a year, which is, uh, <laughs> and you could easily get a scholarship. You, know. um, uh, you take a look across the board. It's hard to imagine there can possibly be an economic reason for this. You can think of reasons, non-economic reasons, like uh, trapping students. They go back to the early 70s and take a look at the elite reaction to the activism of the 60s. It's really worth reading closely. There uh, two major publications came out in the early 70s, the opposite ends of the spectrum about the uh, terrible time of the 60s. It was called the time of troubles, you remember. And it was a troubling time. The country was getting a lot more civilized. And that's pretty dangerous. You don't want that to happen. And there was a reaction from both ends of the spectrum. At the right end, and these are, if you haven't read them, I'd really urge reading these things. At the right end of the spectrum was the Powell Memorandum. To, uh, Lewis Powell, who was a corporate lawyer, worked for tobacco companies and so on. He, Nixon later appointed him to the Supreme Court. He wrote a memorandum, which was secret, but it leaked. It was to the Chamber of Commerce. And uh, it was, uh, you really have to see the rhetoric. The rhetoric is even more interesting than the content. But the, uh, it's, it, the rhetoric is like a spoiled three-year-old who thinks he ought to have the whole world. And uh, somebody took a piece of candy from him, so you have a tantrum. You know, That's exactly what the rhetoric is like. Uh, what, what, uh, he says, look, uh, the business world is being destroyed, he says. Uh, the colleges have been taken over by the far left, led by Herbert Marcuse, who's organizing the whole university system. The media have been taken over by the far left. Uh, everything's collapsing. Uh, the business world is a little embattled sector, you know, uh, which is being beaten down everywhere. And, uh, and he says, well, we got it. He says, we don't really have to accept this because if you look at it, we're the ones who have the funding. We're the trustees. We're the regents. You know? uh, we can fight back and defend ourselves from this assault. Actually, it's not just Marcuse. The other one was Ralph Nader with the consumer uh, advocacy campaigns. This is just destroying the entire uh, free enterprise system. So that's from the far right. Now, then you go to the left, which is more interesting. Uh, that's the study, Crisis of Democracy, that came out from the Trilateral Commission. Trilateral Commission are liberal internationalists from uh, Europe, the United States, and Japan. Uh, it's basically the Carter administration, which was uh, staffed almost entirely from that group, it's that segment. And their picture is the same. The rhetoric is different, it's more moderate and civilized and bigger words and so on, but uh, it's basically the same story. It says uh, uh, the, the 60s, I said, have uh, undermined democracy. That's the crisis of democracy. The crisis of democracy is that most people are supposed to be passive and apathetic. 
and let their betters run things. But they're getting out in the streets, they're demonstrating, uh, women, uh, young people, old people, uh, farmers, you know, the special interests, meaning everybody. And the, the American rapporteur is Samuel Huntington, you know, authentic liberal political scientist. And he kind of looks back with nostalgia to the Truman years when he says, I'm almost quoting, he says, Truman was able to run the country with the help of a few Wall Street lawyers and financiers. And then democracy was functioning. Was no but uh, now we've got all these people, you know, pressing the government and it's too much pressure on the government. So we need more moderation in democracy. And he goes on to the universities. Uh, the, the whole group does, and Huntington formulates it. He says the problem with, there's a problem with what they call the institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young. Okay. This is the liberals I'm quoting. <laughs> there are institutions responsible for the indoctrination of the young, the universities, the schools, you know, the churches, and they're failing. Uh, you can see it from the fact that all these young people are out there demonstrating and protesting and raising questions and so on. So we gotta do something to indoctrinate the young better. Well, I, I don't know if you can draw a direct connection, but the, the fact is that raising tuitions and imposing massive debt and so on does have the impact of indoctrinating the young. You're trapped, I don't have to tell you for obvious reasons. And uh, I think all of this is just part of the whole neoliberal policy. Uh, it's a collection of ideas that kind of fit together, you know. Don't want to say somebody sat down and spelled it all out, but they just naturally fit together. And I think uh, what's happening in the universities is part of it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much.